God is not an angry God demanding absolute holiness and perfection and condemning you to eternal damnation. That's not God. That's the idea that people had about God until Jesus came. When Jesus was born, he was born to reveal God. But as the angels announced his birth, I love that announcement to the shepherds. That's probably my favorite favorite part of the Christmas story. It's the angels showing up all of a sudden, scaring those poor shepherds to death, with the announcement, Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. What's the good tidings of great joy? What's the good news here? The angel went on to say, For unto you this day in the city of David, Bethlehem, is born a Savior, is born someone that will do for you what you've never been able to do for yourself. A Savior, Christ, the Messiah, the Lord. See, at the birth of Jesus, when God sent his Son, he didn't send him in as a judge. He didn't send him in as some sort of a trial lawyer to judge and see whether or not you're good enough. He sent him in to be your Savior, to do for you what you couldn't do for yourself in meeting up to God's standards. You see, the law demands, the law of God demands that you be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That's how Jesus summarized it in the Sermon on the Mount. That's what the law demands. The law demands not only that from now on you're perfect, but that you always have been perfect. I don't know about you all, but it's too late for me. I missed that mark a long time ago. What the law couldn't do was make me perfect. What the law can't do is change you into the image that God designed for you to be. You see, the standard for all of humanity, as far as God is concerned, the standard is the absolute righteousness of Christ. Jesus is a standard for all human beings. That's what a, a functional, healthy human being would look like looks like Jesus but because naturally we can't reach up to that standard we're naturally already condemned so God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law now the reason for emphasizing him being under the law is that Jesus identified himself fully as a human being being born in that manger. Jesus had to grow up, just like we do. He was an infant, then a toddler, and he grew up to be school age. By the time he was 12 years old, he understood who his real daddy was and that he had to be about his business. Jesus had to develop and grow just like we do. He identified himself with humanity for this one reason that all of us and all of humanity could identify ourselves with him and his righteousness. Paul put it this way in chapter 5, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. He said, For he made him who knew no sin, that was Jesus, never did sin, kept the law perfectly, the only person that ever has. He made him who knew no sin to be made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You see, when God sent his son, Jesus, and that we celebrate as Christmas, the birth of our Savior, he was doing for us what we couldn't do for ourselves, revealing his great mercy and his absolute grace and radically conforming us to the image of his son. Now, Paul adds to that in verse 5, the purpose Jesus was sent into this world is to redeem. That means to buy back all of us who were under the law. 
Now, what it means by being under the law is something you're all familiar with. You're raised under the law. It starts with your parents telling you what to do and what not to do. Going over there and beating those little screaming Mimi's butts for yelling and disturbing everybody. That's the law. And then you go to school and you get the teacher's law and you get your buddy's law and that's the peer group law. Then you get introduced to the civil law, the state law, federal law. You live your life entirely under the law, but that, that doesn't really bring it home personal to us. You not only live your life that, you use it. All of us do. Every decision you've made your entire life, naturally, every decision, every choice you make is based on your own knowledge of what you think is right and wrong. That's the law. As a matter of fact, it was embodied in that tree in the middle of the garden. Remember, I said, Adam, I don't want you to eat that tree. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because I know, or think I know, what's right and what's wrong, then I base my choice on it. We have decisions to make. We try to, try, let's figure out the pros here. What are the pros? What are the cons? What's right? What's wrong? What's good? What's evil? And when I know what I think is good and evil, then I make my choices and decisions accordingly. The only problem with that is I'm still dysfunctional as a runover dog. I still blow it because I don't know really what's right and wrong. I just think I do. That's what he meant here by saying to redeem those who are under the law. That's all of us. The only other option we've got besides the law is to take advantage of what Paul reveals next. When you, celebrating Christmas, realize that the birth of Jesus was for the purpose that you might be born again, receiving Christ, and thereby satisfying the demands of God in the law by becoming a brand new person, then you have a personal reason to celebrate Christmas. A very powerful personal reason. And so Paul applies this when he goes on to say the reason he was made under the law to redeem us from under the law that we might be adopted as the children of God. Now think about that a minute. The reason Jesus was born is so he could redeem us out from under that law so that each one of us could be just like Jesus, a child of God. Now John's Christmas story is a little vague like this one. But there he says that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, full of grace and truth. He said, to them that believed, he gave them the authority, the power, to be the child of God. See, that's why Jesus was born. That's what Christmas is all about. It's about God giving you the power to be his adopted child into his family because you are when you accept Jesus as your personal savior you believe that God has done for you what you couldn't do for yourself you believe that angelic announcement that he is your savior he is your messiah your king your lord when you accept that personally at that moment you become a child of God born of the spirit and because you're a child of God God, the Father, sends forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. What does that mean? The miracle of the new birth is just as miraculous as the miracle of the birth of Jesus. It had to be done by God. No one pulls himself up by their bootstraps. They are born of the Spirit. And that miraculous rebirth that you experience in the Spirit as a believer in Jesus Christ, that miraculous rebirth, making you a child of God, 
is sealed by God putting his spirit inside of you. Now, there's so many other things that come together. I don't want to take all night on this. This is Christmas Eve. But I want you to have something. Each one of you have something that you can personally celebrate Christmas with. I can celebrate Christmas because I'm no longer under that law trying to figure out what's right and wrong to make my choices. Because His Spirit lives in me, I've got something a lot better than discerning what's right and wrong. You know what's a lot better? I've got the Spirit of God living inside of me to tell me what to do. I've got the Spirit of God living inside of me as a gift of God to lead me, to guide me into all truth, to teach me, to remind me, to empower me, to comfort me. I don't have to walk alone. I've got the Spirit of God living in me just like Jesus had the Spirit of God living in him. And you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You have the Spirit of God living inside of you. You don't have to lean on your own understanding. You don't have to figure it out. Because you can't. Your only responsibility is to allow Him to control you. That's it. And He does. As He produces His fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. Which, if we're really honest about it, that's what everybody wants at Christmas time. Did you know that? Very first elements, first three elements of the fruit of the Spirit love. I don't know anybody that doesn't want unconditional love at Christmas. And I know a whole bunch of people are freak because they don't get it, especially at Christmas. Joy. Rejoicing. Otherwise known as hope about their future. Peace. Peace that passes all understanding. Remember what the angel told the shepherds? Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. Good will towards men. God manifests his character of grace towards men. Long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. All of these are what the Spirit of God produces in you. So you cry out from your heart, Abba. Abba is an Aramaic term that means best translated in our English words as daddy. Instead of this fearsome, angry, righteous judge, you're approaching God as your daddy, your Abba. You can crawl up into his lap and let him comfort you through his spirit. You see, those are the personal blessings of Christmas. That's why Jesus came. So he could give us those personal blessings. He was born to die. And in his death, we are born to live. As men prepare to close our service here, we're gonna we're gonna close with communion. I'd like for you guys to go ahead and get that in a, in a little candlelight uh, ceremony as they're preparing. I want to talk about one other issue of Christmas. One other personal benefit. The right from the very beginning, before Jesus was ever even born, he came under severe spiritual persecution and attack. Did you know that? It was no coincidence that the world ruler, Augustus Caesar at that time, decided to tax all of Israel and everybody had to go to their home. That was no coincidence. That was by design hopefully to kill Jesus before he was ever born. A matter of a few years after he was born, the puppet king of Israel, Herod, who was appointed by the Roman government to control Judea, Herod, hearing from the wise men that the king of the Jews had been born, here comes the political opposition. See, it's not just the secular humanists trying to get the manger scene out of a public square that started way back when Jesus was born Herod tried to manipulate those wise men to tell him where this king was so he could quote worship him he wasn't planning to worship him he's planning to kill him which was evidenced by the fact that 
several years later when he discovered the wise men tricked him he sent his soldiers to that little town of Bethlehem and killed every male child two years old and younger murdered him. see the coming of God's grace the coming of his goodness the arrival of his son Jesus into this world full of evil and darkness causes a backlash of evil to expound and to explode. What provisions do we have for that? Right here, because you are the sons of God. You are the children of God. God has sent his spirit, the spirit of his son, the spirit of Jesus, the very life of Jesus is in you now. Like Paul said earlier in this very letter, he said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. It is that life of Christ in you that enables you to overcome the evil in your life. It's the life of Christ himself and the power of his spirit enables you to stand fast in the day of opposition it's that very life of Christ himself that is given freely by God through his spirit living in you that transforms you to be just like Jesus just exactly you've got the mind of Christ you've got the high calling of God in Christ Jesus to be Christ to others to love others like he does you're a member of the body of Christ. You're one with Christ. The birth of Jesus Christ didn't accomplish that fact. The birth of Jesus Christ just announced a new contract that God was going to make with humanity. The old contract or the old covenant was, if you behave yourself, I'll bless you. If you don't, I'll curse you. That sound familiar? That's kind of the way we live, right? That's the old covenant. That's the old contract. On the night before Jesus was crucified, he told his disciples, when he picked up that last cup, which is called the cup of blessing, he told his disciples, this cup, come over here, guys, so I can grab a cup. This cup is the cup of my blood which is shed for the remission of sins of many. Now, what he was talking about was the establishment of a new covenant. So when you celebrate Christmas, you think of the birth of Jesus ending in his life of sacrifice, in which he sacrificed his blood to make you a child of God. You see, this was payment of the new covenant. And what does that new covenant do? Three things. Number one, God said, since you can't behave yourself, you can't live up to my law, I'm going to make you behave. I'm going to write my law in your heart and put it in your inward part. And when he brings the Spirit into you, you are made by God to live out the reality of Christ's life. He makes you behave. He didn't wait for you. He makes you. Number two, he says, you're not going to have need that anybody teach you about me. I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. I'm going to talk to you personally and individually. And number three, your sins, your iniquities, all the times you've screwed up, God says, I will remember no more. And the reason he forgets it is not just he's like me, he's forgetful. The reason he forgets it is because he's made you a brand new person that has the righteousness of Christ. Now, when Jesus took this cup, it was a cup of blessing at the Passover meal. And when he blessed it, he also took the bread, he broke it, and he said, this is my body which is being broken for you. And a lot of people get confused. They think it's actually the, the physical body of Jesus Christ. Well, the physical body wasn't broken. Now, he was talking about something Paul would reveal later, and that's the spiritual body. 
believe spiritually we're in the body of Christ and all of us are members one of another. We are members in particular. Jesus being the head and of all of us being members of his body. What does that mean? That means the same good tidings of great joy that I receive that causes me to be identified with Christ and gives me the righteousness of Christ. That same exact righteousness is what you have. Your righteousness isn't any better than mine. Mine isn't any better than yours. Why? Because we're both in Christ. Likewise, that old nasty flesh you've got, that's still that self-centered nature you still have, it ain't any worse than mine. And mine ain't any worse than yours. Sin is sin. Jesus said that night, I want you to take, eat this bread, drink this cup. And as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. From his birth to his death, he came to set us free. From his birth to his death and resurrection, he came to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. So I'm going to bless these elements now and invite you to come and receive them. When you do, I want you also to pick up a candle because we're going to close here with the candle lighting. And uh, and hold, hang on to it. And we'll take it all together. But more than that, when you take this cup and you take this bread, symbolically you are declaring that Jesus is in you and you are in him. And that's the basis of why all of us are worthy. Let's pray together. Father God, as we come before your presence, I bless these elements now, Father, in your name, in the name of your Son, Jesus. I ask you to make it real to us, the knowledge of who we are, who you've made us to be, that we might have a personal application of the joy of Christmas, celebrating the birth of our Savior, that we might learn more and more of the extent of his sacrifice to save us from this world. We ask, Father, that you'd make it real to us through the Spirit living inside that we might glorify you through glorifying your Son, Jesus, for it's in his name we pray. Amen.